Hey, good morning, friends. You're not super responsive. That's okay. That's all right. Hey, it's fine. It's fine. It's great. Hey, it's great to be here to continue on in worship this morning and to be able to open God's Word together and continue in our summer series that we have been in since the beginning of June. We started off back then looking at God's Word, why it's trustworthy, why we can believe it is truly the Word of God. And then from there, we looked at who God himself is in terms of his character and his nature, that we worship one God who exists eternally in three persons, Father, Spirit, and Son. From there, we looked at the nature of humanity, and we learned that we, as God's creatures, are created in his image, unlike anything else he created. We alone are God's image bearers, but we're also in rebellion against God, something the Bible calls sin, and because of that, We're alienated from God and in need of his salvation. Last week, John took us into a look at the church and what it is. Some of you have maybe have seen the film Jesus Revolution. In that movie, it starts off in the opening scene at the beach. It's trying to capture the story of the Jesus movement that took place in the 60s and the 70s. Lots of young people, hippies, came to Christ, began following Jesus, and the opening scene is portraying a beach scene where people are coming to be baptized, to put their trust in Christ. And Chuck Smith, one of the main characters of that story, is asked a question by a reporter. The reporter asks him, how do you explain this movement? And this is what the response was from Chuck Smith. He says, it's not something to explain. It is to be experienced. What a great quote, right? It's something to be experienced. I don't know if Chuck Smith actually said these words, and I don't know what he did and did not mean by them, but that combination of experience and and explanation are things that truly need to go together. We are in dangerous territory if we pit them against each other and say it's an either-or kind of situation. If you only have experience and no explanation, then you're at risk of misinterpreting and misunderstanding what it is that you've experienced. If all you have, though, is explanation, you have a head full of all kinds of information and have never experienced what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then all of that information is useless. We need them both together. And last week, Pastor John took us at an explanation of what the church is. And he helped us see some things that the church is not. That the church is not this building, which I believe he referred to as an architectural marvel. This building that we worship in. And he said, this is not, this is not what the church is. We're not an address. Do we have an address? Yes. Do we have a building? Yes. But we are not that building or that address. Neither are we an appointment. Now, we have a time where we gather for worship every week. But we're not just a spot on the calendar. Rather, the church is the assembly of God's people, the people who have been called by God to follow him, to serve him, to worship him. We gather together in this assembly this morning as God's church, the body of Christ. But then the question with that kind of explanation in mind might be, what should our experience of the church be? What does it look like for us to experience being a part of this assembly together? To see that this morning, we're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I'd invite you to turn there. We're going to have some of this, the verses up here on the slide, like the one you see behind me right now. However, we'll have a lot of verses that I will read in just a minute that are not on the slide, so you may want to have a copy of your own to look at as we go through it. But Paul is writing to a church in a city called Ephesus, So we need to keep in mind right off the bat that this is not a one-on-one conversation, but this is Paul addressing a community of believers, the body of Christ. And this is what he says. I, therefore, he's writing from prison, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So Paul is eager to have them live out their faith, to walk in a way. Walk in Paul's vernacular just means the way you live your life, the way you conduct yourself and your your actions, your words, your attitudes. It should all be done in a way that's worthy. 
Worthiness just is a loaded word, isn't it? It implies something of great value has been given, or there's something big at stake. Paul's saying that this calling to which you have been called is something that should drive you to live in a manner that's worthy of it. So what is that calling? Well, this is where we're going to look at some extended verses out of the book of Ephesians in the first three chapters. You can follow along if you would like. I will be skipping around in just a minute, but this is what it says starting off what Paul writes in verse 3 of chapter 1. He says this to the Ephesians, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. I love that word, riches of his grace. Paul repeats the word riches five times in these first three chapters. We see the riches of his grace on a couple of cages of occasions. The riches of his, his inheritance. We see the riches of Christ Jesus. Paul is saying that what God has done and all that he's given with his grace is of such value that it can only be described as, as riches. If we look at chapter 2, starting in verse 1, I don't know of a more clear explanation of the gospel in all of the Bible than this passage here of Ephesians chapter 2 where Paul says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show, here's our word again, the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Okay, that's a lot of information. Paul's saying a lot there that we don't have time to actually unpack or get into. The bottom line is, he's saying, we were dead and Christ has made us alive. And the church in Ephesus, like a lot of churches in the Greco-Roman Empire of this day, had two basic groups of people who you would not see together in the rest of the Greco-Roman society. Jews and Gentiles. Paul is addressing the Gentiles here, starting in verse 11 of chapter 2, where he says, therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh Skipping ahead here. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Skipping again, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body, through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And then he goes on to describe how these people who were once far off, alienated from God, without hope in the world, have been brought near. And now, not only are they just like frenemies, but they're actually part of the body of Christ as brothers and sisters. So when Paul talks here in verse 1 of chapter 4 about the calling to which you have been called, he is describing something or referencing something that is of immense value. The riches of God's grace. God's call is a gift that calls for a worthy response. It's a call that calls for a worthy response from us. So what does that look like? Well, first... We're going to turn to our statement of faith because Article 8 of our statement of faith says this. It says, We believe that God's justifying grace must not be separated from His sanctifying power and purpose. God's justifying grace is the imagery of a courtroom, of a legal setting where we stand before a judge and we are guilty. 
because we are all sinful. But the judge declares us righteous in spite of that. This is God's justifying grace made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So God has declared us righteous, and the statement here moves on to say we can't separate that, our salvation, from this sanctifying power and purpose of God. Sanctification can refer to a couple of different things, but overall it refers to the holiness of God's people. So we have been made holy, made pure, set apart by God, and that can refer either to our status, and in that case we are already sanctified, but in the practice and everyday experience of life, it's a process by which we grow to exhibit that holiness in our attitudes, in our actions, in our thoughts and desires. That second form, the process, is what is being referred to here. That we can't separate God's salvation in our life from the process of us beginning to and growing into recognizing and realizing that kind of salvation, the growth in holiness in all that we say and do, think and desire. That is what our statement is pointing to. And we can point back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, and say, we should live a life that's worthy of the calling to which we have been called. So now, what does that kind of life look like? Let's keep reading. We're just going to build on this because this is still one statement. And we're just chopping it in middle of sentences or phrases. But here's what it says now as we add in the next piece. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Humility in Paul's day was shameful. It was weak. It was something that people who were inferior would do. It wasn't a popular concept or idea. You would not find a workshop in Ephesus on how to be more humble. In our own day, we love humility. At least, we love to claim humility. We love to assert humility. David Brooks is a New York Times columnist, but he wrote an article for The Atlantic about the humble brag. And the title of his article is wonderful. It says here, truly humbled to be the author of this article. That was the title of his article. And he talks about a tweet from the president of the Central European Bank who tweeted out this, quote, I was humbled to be awarded an honorary degree by the London School of Economics earlier this week. Thank you so much for this prestigious honor. So humbled by my awesomeness. And then Brooks goes on to write some rules for fake humility. And he says this, rule number one, never tweet about any event that could actually lead to true humility. So you would never say, for example, I'm humbled that I went to a party and no one noticed I was there. You would never tweet that out. He also said, you would never tweet out, humbled that I just got fired for incompetence. You would never tweet that out. Another rule of Brooks, though, is to never use a pronoun. You want to start your tweets with humbled to be or honored to be. This sends the message that you only have a few seconds to dash off this tweet because you're so busy and so important. Brookson summarizes by just saying, humility is the new pride. If humility can be fake, we ought to beware as a community ourselves of faking humility. Genuine humility comes from acknowledging and recognizing our position before God. Genuine humility comes from recognizing that fact that we have been given such a gift by God. And by looking around at each other and realizing that we sit among brothers and sisters in the Lord who also have been given such a gift, something that we're not deserving of at all. In fact, there is a New Testament scholar named John Barclay who writes about worthiness and a gift. And he talks about in the first century, you would only give a gift to somebody who was deserving of that gift. You actually had to be really careful that you didn't give a gift to somebody who had a low status or a bad reputation because that would bring shame on you, the gift giver. So in immense contrast to that, we see God giving his great gift to us that's unlike any other gift, that surpasses any other thing we could possibly have. 
And not only that, but we are entirely unworthy of the gift that he has given us. But God has given it to us anyway in such a stark difference from the practice of normally giving gifts. That should lead us to a state of humility of recognizing our true status and dependence upon God. Next, Paul moves on to talk about gentleness. Gentleness is something that we can kind of talk about enjoying, but we also criticize gentleness. We celebrate people who are brash. We talk about people who get things done by walking over everybody else around them. We talk about people who aren't afraid to speak the truth, but their words are like daggers that cut people down. We can talk about people who at least they have a backbone, but they have no filter. Gentleness, in contrast, is something that is the expression of what it means to be humble. Here's a couple definitions that you could think about. It's the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. The quality of not being overly impressed by your own sense of self-importance. When you overlook personal offenses for the good of the community. A community that is gentle is a safe community. A community that is gentle is a stable community. You don't have to worry about the impulsiveness of just a reactive word back at you when you express something that maybe somebody doesn't like to hear. But it's an environment where you can truly be yourself and you can truly feel like you are heard and welcome. That's what gentleness refers to. Patience, on the other hand, is that one thing that people say you should never pray for because you know God will answer it with some great trial in your life. Who wants to pray for that? But patience is like the glue of a community. Patience is something that also builds this idea of stability, of safety within our community, within our midst. One commentator has said this about patience, that it's the ability to make allowances for other shortcomings. It's the exercise of a largeness of soul that can endure annoyances and difficulties over a period of time. Hang out with any group of people long enough and you will begin to notice things that annoy you. It could be mannerisms. It could be the habit of interrupting conversations. It could be the gift that they seem to have for sidetracking a conversation into something that nobody was talking about before. There are all kinds of things that people might do that test your patience. But patience is not the absence in our community of any problem. But patience is in the midst of those problems, in the experience of those problems, the ability to have a measured, gentle response to people. You see how these build on each other. And then here Paul says, bearing with one another in love. Of course, it all comes back to love. Love is the, the virtue that all of these flow out of. But bearing with one another is putting up with people's weaknesses, putting up with their flaws, putting up with their blemishes. Let's face it, some of us are higher maintenance than others. In fact, if you're sitting next to somebody this morning, just subtly, who's high maintenance, just raise your hand. See you? Yeah, I got it. Okay, that's good. That's good, I got it. You know, we, we can joke about this, but I don't want us to miss what all of these together mean. Think about this. A community where Paul says, you're walking in a manner that's worthy of your calling if you display these things. And those things include humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. What does that suggest about what our experience of community should be like in the church? What does that imply about what it means for us to live together as the body of Christ? All of these words demand some level of sacrifice. But that's not always what's first in our mind when we think about community in the church. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a great book years ago called Life Together. I've referenced it before from here, but I want to turn back to it now. 
And he says this, innumerable times, a whole Christian community has broken down because it had sprung from a wish dream. The serious Christian set down for the first time in a Christian community is likely to bring with him a very definite idea of what Christian life together should be and to try to realize it. Let me paraphrase. Bonhoeffer's just saying that we all bring our set of expectations with us into the community of the church. We have different ideas about what would make for great community, different ideas about what a great discussion would be or, or who the people in our community should be. We may have a memory of a community that we've been in in the past and we want to relive that memory in the present in a new setting. And Bonhoeffer's just saying this is a phenomenon that happens and there's this progression then that unfolds when people bring in expectation with them. Let's look at what he says next. He says, the man who fashions a visionary ideal of community demands that it be realized by God, by others, and by himself. He acts as if he is the creator of Christian community, as if his dream binds men together. When things do not go in his way, not, do not go his way, he calls the effort a failure. So what Bonhoeffer is saying is that it starts off with expectations that you bring to the community. And those expectations can morph into demands from the community. And those demands then can turn into disappointment and disillusionment when you find that your demands are not being met. And the last stage finally is destruction, where you destroy the community because it was a failure to meet your own expectations in the first place. I just want to say, as a pastor of community life, people like me and me included, I stand up here on a stage like this and often talk about the value of Christian community. And while I firmly believe that the idea of living as a Christian in the New Testament means living in community, living in a smaller community where you can know and be known, I do want to say that sometimes we have a tendency to celebrate it and to push it so much that it can come across as though community is just awesome in every way. And we don't talk about the struggles and the difficulties that can come along with it. And to the extent that I've done that, I would just say, I'm sorry, that's not my intent. However, I don't apologize for encouraging you into community. I do believe that that's the place where we grow and flourish and where God does much of his work in our lives I mean, we saw examples of God's community banding together just this last week in the midst of tragedy. And it was a beautiful, priceless picture of the body of Christ coming together to love each other. We would never replace that. But is it always easy? No. No. In fact, sometimes the community we want is not the community we need. It's just a fact. Sometimes the community we want is not the community we actually need. And it's not what God desires for us. But he does desire community for us. So with Bonhoeffer's quote in mind, and with these attributes in mind that Paul talks about is what we need, we, re, we understand that this is a community called to sacrifice. The next line of our statement of faith says this. It says, we believe that God's justifying grace must not be separated from his sanctifying power and purpose, and God commands us to love him supremely and others sacrificially and to live out our faith with care for one another. All of these come together to paint a picture of sacrifice among us as brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what we're called to. We are called to love God supremely because he is the one who has given us these great riches of his grace undeserved we are unworthy but he's the one who even though we were dead in our sins and our trespasses he made us alive before the foundation of the world he chose us in him and those of us who were far off we were without hope and without God in the world he has brought us near and he has grafted us into the family of Christ as brothers and sisters together because of that, we love him supremely, but we love each other sacrificially in these ways. With patience, with gentleness, with humility. We, we bear with one another in love. This is what our calling is. And Paul says then, as he continues and finishes the sentence finally in verse 3, that we do all of this 
eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's a beautiful word here that's easy to miss, and it's this word, maintain. Our job is not to create this community. Our job is not to establish it, not to build it, but to maintain it. There's a big difference between that. We can come into this community with the assurance that God's Spirit has built it. God's Spirit has designed it. God's Spirit has brought us together. And our job is to maintain it, to work together. Are there times where we need to do more maintenance than others? Of course. But our job is to maintain this thing that God has established by His Spirit. This is a supernatural community established by God, and we get to be a part of it. We get to be a part of it in these ways. And we go after it with all of our energy, with all of our effort. We, we do whatever it takes to maintain this unity that God has given to us. And as we do, we have the confidence of knowing that God's Spirit is equipping and empowering us. Our response is worthy when we love each other sacrificially in this way. But the final word from Paul in this passage this morning is that as we live out this community, we actually testify, we display something of God's nature and God's character himself. Here's what Paul says in 4 through 6. He says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Paul goes through this repetition, one, one, one. He repeats it seven times in here, not by accident, because the number seven is the number of completeness or perfection. Paul is emphasizing the unity of God and the unity of our call, the unity of the gospel that we all rally around together. And we're doing this with all of the aspects of God's nature. Spirit, Lord, a reference to the Son of God, to Jesus, and Father, who is in all, through all, and over all, pointing to the fact that God is everywhere with us, but yet God is also separate from us, his transcendence and his imminence. But God is doing this work in our community, and as we, as we love each other sacrificially, we display his unity, we display his nature, we display his purposes. We might just say that our lives are worthy of God's call when our community reflects or experiences experiences the unity of his call. We walk in a way that is worthy when our community experiences that unity of who he is himself, the one God in three persons of God. There's no better way than to end a look at community from this angle than by being able to turn now to the Lord's Supper as we look at the idea that there's one body, there's one cup that we all symbolically partake of, that unites us together, that we are this community that is formed by the one God and his sacrifice on our behalf. We get to live that out now as we take the bread and drink from the cup that unites us, that was paid for by this outlandish gift of God that he just poured out on us in his grace. This is the cup and the bread that unites us. And as we prepare to take it, let's just take a moment to quiet our hearts and to thank God personally for his sacrifice on our behalf so that we can enjoy this meal together as a family. If you're helping to serve, would you come forward now? Father, it's your sacrifice that makes possible our community. And it's your sacrifice that, that saves us, that justifies us. Thank you.
your presence with us now that allows us to live out the calling to which we have been called in a way that is worthy. Father, thank you for the great cost that you were willing to pay so that we might have fellowship together with you and experience your grace and experience the joy of being one body of which you are the head. Lord, as we take this bread and drink from the cup, I pray that we would do it in a way that is worthy. Father, that, that we would do so as one body looking to you and your costly sacrifice on our behalf. Thank you for your grace, Lord. Thank you for this meal. I pray this in your name.